Hello, everybody. I love your background. I want a background. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Stop paying attention when we were doing the lead up to this uh, to choose a background. So it was time well spent. I want a background. I don't even know. Hmm. Mine's a pretty generic picture of uh, other space. That's all right. If other space looked like a Lisa Frank folder. Um, that probably would, wouldn't be too good. Oh, I know what I should do for this. Now you just have a background of veggies. You certainly can. Oh, my background is a bunch of veggies. You're, you're much more on theme than, than I was. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we're talking about food security. It's a special topics meeting. Um, we're helping with the Community Resiliency Project. My name is Charla uh, Burnett. I am uh, Charla's partner, Michael, um, a PhD student at Global Governance and Human Security at the McCormick School for Global Studies and Policy. And uh, both her and I are working on uh, building networks of resilience within the Lansing community across a number of dimensions. Yeah, so um, a lot's been happening. Uh, unfortunately, it's only us today, but Saturdays are difficult for people. So we're going to carry on and talk about kind of what's been going on with the program so far. Um, if you watched any of the other videos, then you would kind of understand that we're trying to do a participatory approach. Um, and so now that we've been doing research on all the organizations uh, in Lansing that relate to food security, we're going to be doing outreach uh, to them and hopefully get members of other organizations uh, involved and to solicit some um, feedback on how we can better support programs that already exist in Lansing. We don't want to remake the wheel. We want um, to involve programs that are already in together and then try to raise money for them um, and maybe provide um, some support uh, through our consultancy organizing together. Um, so let's share my screen and talk kind of about what is going on with the Community Resiliency Project. Um, so inside the meeting minutes and on this video, you will get a link to a folder on Google Drive that has all of the work that we've been doing. Um, and this is a, a Fledge endorsed program. So we're working a lot with the community center here in Lansing. Um, there's a project description. We now have the website up at lansingresilient.org slash join. Um, we have a logo together. We've put together um, Facebook events page, social media uh, tags to be able to update and do outreach. Um, so anybody can get involved at any point. You don't have to wait for us or wait for someone to respond. You can start sharing that information. Um, you can interact with the project at any point and then leave at any point. Um, and we have meeting minutes, we have our volunteer partnership form and organizational outreach. So if you know of an organization that deals with social equity, um, food security, waste management, or sustainable energy, please drop them down into that list and we will get a hold of them um, and, and kind of solicit some feedback on how we can better help make Lansing more resilient on those four aspects of community resiliency. Um, since uh, this, the last week's meeting, uh, we also kind of put together some voting norms. Uh, I put it together so we can talk about them and change them up as we go. I just thought it was good to, to go ahead and draft some. Um, so voting is like really important. And since this is a participatory uh, based approach, I was hoping um, that we could get buy-in from the community at 1%. So there's 115,000 residents living here in Lansing, Michigan. Um, so that would be 1,150 people to respond to a survey saying that they would be interested in the program or initiatives that are pitched by the Community Resiliency Project. Um, so we have 
one survey on food sustainability that's already up on our website. If you could go there and take it, if you're from Lansing, um, and then once we get enough people interested in a specific program or project, we will reach out to you and invite you to participate. Um, and so we needed some sort of way of like voting for the people who are actually showing up from the community. Um, and a vote passes at 70% of uh, attendees and absentee ballots. So when something's up for vote, vote, it has to go on social media. It has to um, be sent out in an event and you can vote absentee on that event. Um, and we'll tally it up with the people who are present at the meeting. So these are just ideas. Um, we can talk about them um, and change anything. Um, but anybody can pitch a new pro project. They just have to get uh, community buy-in. Um, there is some discussion on creating new norms. So we can add group norms or take them away. But these are kind of the ones that I have used in the past doing community organizing uh, and that I've, I've found from the literature on community organizing. Um, so it's really important that we show each other respect um, and uphold an equitable uh, distribution of, of resources and ideas um, and challenge ourselves to change our mindset. Um, because if we're gonna be more resilient, we have to be more cooperative. Um, so feedback on that would be great. Feel free to leave comments in the uh, actual document um, and we'll talk about them next time. Um, there's a formal grievance process. Um, we believe that there should be some accountability for people who are holding back um, the actions and interests of the project. Um, so people um, have negative behaviors, have to take a, like a timeout. Um, they're more than welcome to come to any of the meetings during timeout. But what it means is you can't talk. Like you just need to listen um, so that we can all learn to be better listeners and then realize that other people need an opportunity to talk. Um, and you can do this by letting, if you feel like someone is hogging the show, you can say, um, you know, I, I feel like these, these um, behaviors are happening in the meeting right now. If the facilitator at that meeting seconds the motion, then that person will be asked to take a step back for the remainder of that meeting. Um, if it's someone's second violation, then they have to also take a step back in that meeting and the next meeting. Um, and then that person will just keep losing out on like speaking privileges at the um, meetings if they can't uh, change the behavior. Um, and is they there, uh, is, sorry to break in. Is there a point when uh, voting rights are completely stripped? Like, is there a you know if it's a person's third offense? Because I saw in there that it says um, you know voting rights are still to be maintained. And this is just kind of a policy wonk in me setting up a, a, a new institution. Yeah. Uh, in and of itself. Um, so is there a point where? you know, there's a probationary period and the person, you know, who's the, you know, the offender and has been seconded uh, a few times um, loses the right to participate in a meeting's vote if it comes up or do they always have, um, you know, the ability to, to vote? They always have the ability to vote. Um, and I, my kind of thought process was that um, I am an adamant believer that stripping someone of the right to vote is like, an egregious act against someone's human rights. Right, yeah. Um, and, and it's one thing that I like, really try to challenge in the US legal system. Um, yeah, no, because that's, that's I, I appreciate that because I noticed, um, you know, in the beginning to, to vote for a new project, you basically need 70% of the uh, attending, um, you know, participants, uh, in addition to any absentee ballots that might be there. Um, you know, and those, those I'm sure are very important decisions. So we, want people to be respectful and, you know, uh, hopefully moderate themselves uh, in, a, in, in the conversation. Um, but we definitely want everybody to have a voice in the, in the process, um, especially when it comes to voting for, uh, for new projects. So yeah, and I like just I, I feel like that injustice is so high that it just angers the person who's who's not able to at least still like right. feel like they count. But there is, there's stronger grievance policies for like sexual harassment and violence um, as well. And um, we have, I would hope everybody would agree to have zero um, tolerance 
Um, and so there is a grievance, grievance process for that um, in here as well. So I would take a look at that and please provide feedback um, on any of it. And then I kind of go over um, the facilitator's role because I really believe that the facilitator is the, one of the most important roles. And what it means to be like a good facilitator is to not interject with your own opinions about things, but coax the opinions out of people who normally don't take up space, who normally don't engage in the conversation. Um, because a lot of people won't engage in a conversation unless you ask them directly like what their opinions are. Um, so there's just like some guidelines for facilitators here. Um, so anyone can facilitate the meeting. Um, I, I think lots of times just having it organic usually works. Like whoever shows up, you say like who wants to be the facilitator that day. And if somebody wants to step up who normally doesn't, they're given priority so that they can practice being a better facilitator. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, that, um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I was thinking it might be a good idea once we um, you know, continue down this path to possibly uh, put some of this uh, like facilitator kind of training course on our OT network. Um, you know, there's a number of different courses that we put up there um specifically designed um you know they're free and, and specifically de designed uh, to address issues of resilience uh especially um during these uncertain times you know how you can be a little bit more resilient as an individual and a community um so uh i, I do encourage anybody out there who's watching this to to check out the um otf.com otf.com the url um, at uh, dot organize together dot network. So why don't you say that one more time? Uh, <laughs> I, I app dot organize together dot network. Okay. Um, yeah, and maybe at some point we can formalize, uh, you know, the facilitator role, and you know, someone can take like a three minute training course just to so they they know. That's you a know, really good idea. We can track the analytics on that, so we know the person facilitating has kind of internalized some of you know, the rules and the things that we're trying to uh, create. But um, yeah, so I think, it's, I think it's a great idea to have a little bit more structure. I mean, we don't need to do Robert's rules of procedure, but I, I, I like um, formalizing this process a little bit and making sure the uh, speaking time can be uh, more equitable. Because anybody who's watched these videos uh, in the past will know that I also talk quite a bit and can get going. I'm very excited about these topics, you know, and, and just want to get my, my hands dirty. So it's, it's uh, these type of policies are uh, a good way to kind of remind yourself. It's like wearing the, the protective gloves in stores, you know, it reminds you not to touch your face. You know, these rules are good because they remind you to share the, the space and, and so everybody has a, has a voice and can be heard. So yeah, I like it. And if you see us breaking the fourth wall and I'm looking over to my right and Charla is looking over to the left, I hate to break this to you, I am not in outer space. Uh, Charla is actually sitting to my right, so I am, <laughs> I just have the urge to continue to kind of look over here and, you know, point to you. So yeah, no, I, I can see doing it too. Home, that's what, what's happening. Um, so that's great. I, I think that that's, that's a really good idea to get a course up for that too. Um, there's a bunch of new courses that are going to be coming out here in the next few weeks. Um, so this is definitely something we can add to the roster. Uh, all of, we've decided right from the beginning that all of our meetings are going to be uh, recorded. We believe that that provides accountability for people's um, actions and words. Uh, we know that some people are going to be uncomfortable with that. Um, and there are opportunities to have meetings that are not recorded, but the main um, organizational meetings will be recorded. It's also a benefit to new members because they're they're able to catch up on meetings and kind of uh, get their feet wet before they actually have to jump into a meeting because that can be kind of a little nerve wracking for some people. So um, being able to go back and just see what's been done, what's been talked about, you know, what the context is, um, I think will will most people will agree that that um, outweighs the uh, the weirdness of recording it because I get pretty clammy and awkward uh, while recording. So yeah. For sure. And um, actually, probably once the COVID's done, I would like to maybe even instill a talking stick um, situation because I think a lot of people in the West have never used talking sticks. 
um, but they're used all around the world um, in, in communities. And it really does help people come to terms with the way that they talk to other people. Because a lot of times we think about uh, what we're going to say before someone's even finished speaking. And it's, I struggle with it uh, myself. And so I, I find that when I have somebody has the talking stick and it's their time to talk, I'm, I'm listening more actively to what they're saying. The visual reminder is absolutely helpful. Again, you know, it's not done in malice. People just get excited and want to talk about the, the you know, the conversation, but it's good to hear uh, from, from everyone. You know, and we want this, like uh, Charlotte said, to be a kind of consensus-based, participatory-driven initiative uh, from the community of uh, Lansing. So I think that helps with a long way of ensuring that that's what we do. Um, one thing that we're asking people uh, in Lansing, if they're is interested in participating, um, if they could go to our website and take a couple of surveys. You can also sign up and we'll email you to um, send out reminders for uh, the events and the discussions. Um, but here is uh, our social equity survey so far and our food security survey. And what we're really trying to understand in these surveys, which I'll just, I'll just pull it up. So in our last discussion, our special topics meeting was on social equity. Um, and we realized that a lot of people might not have the same understanding of social equity. Um, and that might make it difficult to talk about. And we also wanted to know about people's perspectives on social equity. Um, and so you'll take it, you'll see like you have an email address. You, I, we ask if you have heard of the term social equity. Um, does inequality exist in Lansing, Michigan? Because obviously like that's interesting to know too if this is a non-starter for people in the community, although I know that it's not, um, it, it would be good to know that too because we have a tendency of assuming that that is the perspective of every community, but it's not. Um, and so we wanted to know a little bit more about that. We wanted people to define social equity uh, in their own words. Uh, and then we asked if they were concerned about inequality in Lansing and asking them which groups they perceive as being most unequal or least unequal. Um, Maybe we could also, in that section, um, add a, uh, like a how, like an open-ended, like, you know, if uh, people are unequal, like along what dimension, you know, um, and people can, Right, you know, as, as many characters as they want about, you know, is it is it related to like voting rights, access to education, is it, you know, access to food, um, you know, uh, it, all of the above, you know, uh, having having more detail in these type of uh, questions, I think would be really helpful for us in terms of how we direct our energies for uh, future projects. Yeah, and I was also very uh, interested too to compare it to like a actual statistics. So, right. you know, if people perceive racial minorities or immigrants as um, being the least or most unequal, what does that really say in social economic terms and educational terms? Um, and, and so I wanted to see if there was a misperception among what's real um, and, and kind of what is perceived an inherent bias in us. Um, so I think that this, this survey is definitely gonna be followed up with some sort of focus group uh, type discussion on it once we get more people involved, which again might be difficult just due to COVID. Um, I mean, this the project was created in a response to COVID, but it's definitely like a lifelong process of building community resiliency, right? And anything can come in the way of that resiliency at any point um, if we're not focused on it. Um, and I think that that's something that we need to be much more aware of. There's going to be other pandemics. There's going to be climate change. You know, and these uh, kind of catastrophes also serve as really like great opportunities to start 
building in more socioeconomic and environmental sustainability in our systems because we are seeing the degree to which our, the systems that exist in modern society, how fragile they are. Um, so like as Charlotte said, you know, this is a, a lifelong process to, to make society not just environmentally sustainable, but also um, you know, socially equitable, which is a kind of dimension of sustainability. You know, you can't be sustainable if um, large percentages of your population are suffering and, you know, don't have homes, don't have access to food, uh, don't have access to uh, educational opportunities, you know. So, um, so while these, you know, these disasters and pandemics are uncertain and scary, um, I think it's, it's a great opportunity um, for us to correct some of the, you know, historic wrongs. An exciting project. Yeah, and so we're we're hoping to get more feedback on the, that specific aspect with this survey. Um, you know, we we just ask if you would be interested in in participating in social equity discussions or town halls. Our goal here is to organize with all of the organizations that are already working on these types of town halls and bring them um, in and hopefully raise some money for them and be able to do more training workshops um, with multiple like micro communities within our community. Um, and you know, you know, asking you what you think you should be done about social equity in Lansing, Michigan. You know, maybe you have a better idea of what needs to be done than, than we have put together so far. Um, and so we're always open to new projects and discussions as as shown in the in the group norms um, and you know if you know of any other organizations working on this please let us know because we would love to start reaching out to them which will begin next week um, as the topic is supposed to be food security today um, I'll kind of pivot now to more of that discussion um, we, we put together this preliminary food security uh, survey based off of a program um, that I I kind of thought about um, and I'm not really sure if it's adequate for our community uh, I get mixed feedback from organizations working in urban farming um, so I want to know more um, and obviously there needs to be more community buy-in um, so what it talks about is obviously your email you know what is food security to you uh, and I would love to know, Michael, what do you, what is food security to, to you? Um, I would say food security is having access to things that will make you healthy. Um, you know, there's a lot of places that, um, I, I believe the term is food deserts, where people are only able to kind of uh, purchase very unhealthy, tra high trans fat calorie uh, food that's cheaper than um, you know, vegetables and things like uh, fruits that will make you uh, feel better, you know. Um, it's, one, it's one of the um, really kind of interesting, you, you see where the kind of money flows um, that in times of, um, you know, this disaster that McDonald's and a lot of the fast food chains um, are considered, you know, essential food services um, instead of kind of strengthening um, these local networks, um, these more decentralized networks of food production that um, is closer to where the person is living, which you know cuts down on carbon emissions through transportation and you know decreases the cost that way. Um, you know, so it's it's making sure that people everywhere in your community can can go to a community garden, afford um, you know the the products at a farmer's market, you know, and have that access to those. Um, those products uh, all year round. Um, so I think I think that's really important. So the you know the it, the access, not having it price prohibitive, um, and um, ins ensuring that you know people even if they don't have vehicles or uh, you know public transportation isn't particularly uh, great in certain parts of town, um, ensuring that people are still like within walking distance of um, you know food sources that will make them and their families healthy. I think that's on a, at least in the United States context. I think that's you know I think what we should be striving for. Um, and you know one of the um, kind of um, octagonal uh, or, or you know the uh, another project that we have going that's kind of adjacent to this is the idea of waste. You know, and a lot of uh, 
the food waste, you know, I, I believe the figure is somewhere around um, like two thirds of what is produced for food ends up uh, in the dumpster, you know, while people in the United States and around the world are starving, you know, and this latest round of pandemic, I mean, the global food um, uh, organizations are predicting like another 265 million people uh, not having access to food and nutrition for their families. Uh, so, you know, thinking about how we can make these networks more efficient of, of you know, uh, kind of how do we harness the community networks of urban farmers and the farmer mar farmers markets and, and these type of things so we can ensure that everybody is getting, um, getting food in the community. So, sorry, that's a long-winded answer for that. No, that's, that's great. Thank you so much. So that, that is one of the questions we want to know from the community, what they think about food security. And is it something that's even like, uh, important to them? Um, obviously, it's, it's pretty important. Um, I think I have the wrong thing here. Oh. Let me bring this up so I don't have to actually take, or maybe I'll just take it. It's fine. Yeah, we want to know what you think too. So everybody should submit the survey. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to have to take the whole survey though. Uh, I'm very concerned about it. Obviously, I <laughs> put together this. Um, <laughs> And I am interested in growing food. So one part of also what me and Michael are, are working on is trying to actually do this. So I don't know about all of you guys who watch this video, but I have never been uh, very good at keeping plants alive, let alone farming. My grandparents have a very small farm, but would just mostly out horses and bees and that's that's it but I've always been interested and I've been living in big cities for a long time so I was never able to really plant anything and this year we have our own like little backyard that we're turning into a garden we got chickens and we're almost done with the chicken coop yeah <laughs> broken bone number two <laughs> Michael dropped his phone um and so I, I, we have been very concerned and we want to try to do this. And we actually have rented a plot uh, on Foster Street as well. And we want to use that uh, as a way to learn and to teach. So if anyone's interested in getting on that plot, um, we would really like to, to have more people involved. Um, so I am interested very much. And then it also asks um, the public, like how many hours a week you could spend growing your own food. So this is something that's really interesting to me because a lot of the organization leadership that I've talked to about um, food security who work on urban farming say, you know, they've been trying to do urban farming for years here and a lot of people will get interested in it as a hobby, but then not really follow up and aren't really good at taking care of it. Um, and obviously that's a problem if we want to be food secure in through our own initiative. So I'm interested to know like how many hours a week you could spend on your own food. Like, is this going to be momentary for COVID? Um, you know, or is this, this is how much you can actually like give, um, you know, are you interested in a paid position to help grow food? Uh, we find this question very interesting because we have, if things were to get worse, uh, we would need more people obviously to work with local farmers. Um, and if you're interested and you would do that, we, we obviously want to know so we can help um, share that information with them. Um, also, what would most likely stop you from growing your own food? Um, you know, for me, it was very knowledge based. And the time commitment. Yeah. And so each of the answers has like another set of follow up answers. You know, if it's knowledge, it's like, would you take an online class to learn about your own food? Uh, would you go to a local farm to learn how to grow your own food from experts? So each of these questions is very tailored to understanding like what is holding you back and then what you would do or be willing to do to um, not to overcome that thing that's been holding you back from urban farming. The goal of this survey um, is to get feedback on a pitch uh, for a new project that has to do with um, working with a local company who prepares food 
and individuals would be able to plot out their yard. Um, we were hoping that we could get buy-in from the local government where they would incentivize uh, landlords to allow their renters to do urban gardening or provide um, with the um, people with space on these plots because we have an amazing um, amount of urban farming places through the land bank. Um, and then also um, focus specifically on one crop for each family. So you don't have to learn a lot of different techniques. It really should be set to one, making it easier for you. And then the company would come and they would pick up all the yields. They would take what they needed to pay their workers. And then they would come and deliver either packaged uh, uncooked meals that need to be prepped by you or all the way cooked food, um, which is their specialty. So um, in that way, like no matter what your job looks like, you have security knowing that you're going to get food um, based on that program, at least in the summertime with the hopes of being able to like also teach about canning um, and, and these types of things. And we've been working to put together um, some online classes on urban farming in addition to that project. So with that feedback, hopefully we can work something out and create a project that fits people's needs um, a bit more. But again, our goal for both of these surveys is 1,150 people in the Lansing community. So our first priority is probably to raise money for advertising to get those out to people um, and to contact all of the organizations involved in food security and then also the local government um, and try to get them on board. So one resource that uh, I was just thinking about is, you know, every now and then the Allen Street Market sends out their um, uh, bi-monthly uh, newsletter, bi-monthly, um, not sure exactly when the intervals are, but uh, they had a lot of um, food share programs that were um, basically cutting the cost for low income families. Um, so I think we could possibly add that, you know, they're, they're right down the street there. And I know they've kind of buttoned up operations because of COVID, but um, we could possibly reach out to those um, farm share uh, initiatives and see what they would be willing to do for people specifically in Lansing. Um, Cause those are great, you know, you get three months of, of produce delivered to you from fresh local sources. Um, you know, if, we can, if you can get that, for people who don't have the means to spend several hundred dollars on that, then you know all the better. So um, look into that. Yeah, and see what we can do, like for delivery, because I think one aspect that's really holding people back is the fact that you have to pick it up. I believe from ANC. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure. Actually, no. I think that the their paid one is is delivered. Yeah, when I when I lived in New Hampshire, the um, the, the farm shares a lot of them uh, delivered. And that was several years ago. So uh, hopefully, you know, we can um, add this to the spreadsheet as we add those um, and kind of put in the notes whether or not they, they deliver and kind of rank them in the order of Yeah, priority. we're trying to like get a little right, right, right up in description about each of the organizations, which will end up going like on our web page um, so that if you are looking for like food security programs, like they're all in one place. Absolutely. Having the resource page is, is huge, you know, and it will, we can just, try to direct traffic to our page so more people are aware of those things that are going on. Try to centralize some of that. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at. In the next week, we're gonna be reaching out to all these organizations and all four aspects and seeing what programs that they have. So we're gonna be doing a lot of phone banking. If anyone's interested in calling organizations with us, please let us know. We'll be doing that over the next two weeks. Um, and so we'll be writing a script for that uh, coming out next week, which you'll obviously be able to find in the Google Drive. Don't feel like you need to wait for us uh, to call some of these organizations and get started. Um, all you really need to know is just like, we're just gaining information. Um, and we'll probably, what we'll do is create a survey um, for organizations based on in the script where you can just enter, enter more um, information or send them a survey where they can enter more information. Um, because then we can, you know, collect it all and, and be able to put it in the resource guides. But this is a 100% community initiative. Like nobody's getting paid for it. Uh, so we could also uh, possibly set it up 
you know, when I worked uh, at the UNH Survey Center, uh, we would have the people doing the phone banks basically um, go line by line up the survey, you know, so it's basically, you know, one barrier to getting the survey, uh, you know, getting information out of the survey, it's getting people to um, actually take the survey. So when, you know, people on the phone are actually reading the lines, like, would you take an online class to learn how to grow your own food? Um, you know, it's more conversational, and then the person on the other line can. Um, yeah, maybe we should do a course on phone banking. Yeah, uh, something like that. Make it more, um, again, kind of formalized. Phone banking. What was the other course? Uh, phone banking, and then the other one was uh, for the facilitator. Facilitator. Role, or any other roles that we would have in a uh, meeting space. Yeah. Sounds good. We'll work on those things um, in the next couple weeks. weeks. Yeah. yeah, and our next uh, meeting is going to be two weeks from now. That one's going to be on waste. And we're going to be talking not just about like physical waste, like the material waste that we have when we put stuff in trash, um, but also like um, social and uh, human capital waste. Um, where some of the most brilliant and amazing people in our community are not able or empowered to be able to provide the rest of the community with the great things that, that they can bring to the table. So we'll be talking about both of those. And as we get going and continue down this path, we'll uh, get us closer to having tangible programs in each of these dimensions of what we see as community resilience. Um, but we're still hoping to get input from you, from the community. Um, if there's something, you know, that goes beyond food security, waste, um, energy renewability, um, please reach out, let us know um, what you think uh, could be added to that and uh, where you think that our energies uh, could be spent uh, in a worthwhile manner. So we hope to uh, continue to get more community buy-in as, as we go and, and build this into something that can really impact the community for the better. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. See you next time.